This is Dr. Daniel Caruso. He has uh, his office in Reno, and for the past year he has been our medical director, and we've been doing everything under his supervision. He's a great specialist, and he's going to answer your questions today. All right. Thank you. Thanks. I, I really appreciate being invited for this uh, presentation. You're going to be doing most of the work by providing questions and kind of a stunt the doc or frequently asked questions type program. Uh, I do want to start off with an introduction about myself. Uh, I was born and raised in Reno and went to medical school there and uh, did my fellowship at Ohio State then came back to start private practice. Uh, right now I probably see over 200 people a month with diabetes and then an additional handful of other types of conditions. But the vast majority of my practice is diabetes. Uh, some people come to me specifically because I have diabetes and I think that I'll be more forgiving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly more understanding. I've, uh, I was diagnosed at age four. I've been on insulin for 44 years. I've been on a pump for 10. I know it's like to do four finger sticks a day. I've been doing that for 25 years. Uh, the first 20 years I had off because they didn't invent them before then. Uh, I, I didn't have a lot of com confidence in pump technology until about 10 or 12 years ago. And so I, I know what it's like to have the highs and the lows and the nuisance of testing and not feeling good and having everything else in life happening as well as still having to do with the diabetes. Uh, somehow I got through my teen years without a lot of uh, trauma or stress with my diabetes, which uh, I, I still see happen sometimes. Uh, but it was because I wanted more than anything to be a doctor and I knew if I didn't keep myself healthy, I wouldn't get into medical school. And so that was my motive to pretty much stay clean through high school and college and otherwise behave myself. And I think that goes to point out that ultimately our actions speak louder than our words. That someone might say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, but what you actually do is what you've decided to do. And someone, for example, who has heart disease and high cholesterol and all kinds of plugged arteries, and they say they want to get healthy, they want to get their diabetes under control, and yet every night they're having this huge uh, plate of uh, uh, rice and, uh, and, and uh, sausage, oh, well, there's the choice you're making that, uh, that the food is more important than your health. And so we live that out, and it's not a lifetime decision. You make that decision moment by moment, uh, that, that each time you decide to do something, you're deciding, is it my health, is it my appetite, yeah. is it my family, is it my work, uh, what, how you're organizing your priorities and deciding what to do for yourself. It, when I became a specialist, there were two categories of medications. Uh, there's one kind of pill, the glipizide category, and uh, animal insulin. So human insulin had just come out at that time, but that was still in the category of insulin. We now have nine different categories of medications. Uh, the insulins have gotten fancier, and we have an additional seven more tilt type agents. Uh, they all work through different mechanisms, which is why there's so many, and some work for some folks and not for others. Uh, there are, of course, the associated side effects with any of these medications that we have to balance out. And a lot of people have this pathological feel of the needles or of the insulin. And the truth is, it doesn't hurt. If you don't like the finger sticks, you're not going to mind the insulin because the insulin doesn't hurt nearly as bad as the finger sticks. Uh, especially, now the finger sticks are a lot easier if you replace that lancet more than once a month or once a year. <laughs> <laughs> I have to whack myself three or four times to get a drop of blood, it's my reminder that I need to put a new poker in there. Uh, but the insulin uh, needle going into your belly is far, far less painful than that uh, jabber going into your finger or the back of your arm. So if you're, if you're in that situation where you're being faced with that decision, uh, don't let the needle part scare you. Uh, ask your doctor or ask Tracy to give you a blank and it will be in and out without even knowing that it happened in most cases. So, so don't let that be the, uh, the obstacle between you and getting better health. Any questions at this point? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I'm a type 2 and under control and everything. A1C is all good and everything. But at night, my uh, blood sugar is normal, but in the morning it's always up. And why is that? 
the, the blood sugar can go up between nighttime and the morning for a couple of different reasons. The most common is what's called the dawn phenomenon. And the brain sends a signal to the liver to make sugar so you wake up and go get breakfast. And that happens around dawn. It kicks in somewhere between 2 and 4 o'clock in the morning and runs uh, anywhere from 3 to 6 hours. And it's, it's programmed. Your, your liver has no idea what your blood sugar is. The part of your brain that regulates this has no idea what your blood sugar is. All it knows is that it's on the clock and there is 2 o'clock, it's time to kick in the sugar. When you don't have diabetes, the pancreas makes a little bit of insulin. So the liver doesn't make too much, and so that sugar goes into the muscle so you can get out of bed and go get breakfast. But when the diabetes is present, the liver ignores the insulin, maybe the pancreas doesn't make enough insulin, and the morning sugar is quiet. Mm. And it can be exceptionally frustrating. <coughs> uh, there are various medications that are more likely to regulate that. Uh, if the A1C is good and the fasting blood sugars are the only culprit, I don't know that I'd be real worried about it if the A1C is otherwise looking reasonable. Uh, there's been some research to indicate that it's probably the blood sugars after meals that do more damage than the blood sugar first thing in the morning. And so it might be more important to pay attention to controlling the rest of the day as opposed to just morning. Now some folks and they're waking up at 180 and it happens an hour before they get up and it's down an hour later. So two hours out of 24 their, their numbers are out of line. They have an A1C of six, six and a half percent, and I'm not going to panic about those two hours of the day that they're elevated. Now for people on insulin, it may be that the insulin isn't kicking in at the right time to keep the morning sugar down. It may be that their blood sugar is dropping too low in the middle of the night and bouncing back up. Uh, there have been some rare instances where people were getting up and eating without knowing it. Uh, I, had a couple, I had one gentleman who knew that. I, I, found, I knew about it because his wife knew about it. <laughs> and she'd find all this stuff in the kitchen the next morning that was out, pulled out of the refrigerator, plates dirty, and he had no recollection. He couldn't tell me what he ate or how much or anything else. We tried all kinds of different things. Let's put some food out for him so we know how much he's getting, and none of them seems to make any difference. Uh, there's been some rare reports of sleeping tools causing people to do this in the middle of the night, uh, to eat without knowing. Uh, but, but those are pretty exotic circumstances, I think, the, and the dawn phenomenon is a very common condition. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mine's high, my blood sugar is high two hours after I eat. And it's sometimes over 300. And it might be mile nine in the morning when I get up. Uh, that, that says that the, the pancreas isn't responding properly to the food. Mm -hmm. uh, that the carbohydrates are exceeding the, the pancreas capacity to produce insulin. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing that can happen sometimes is that the liver, instead of storing things, will actually release sugar during a meal as well. So then you get a double whammy. Not only is the food raising it, but the liver is doing it at the same time. Uh, cutting back on the carbs enough can often cure that. Uh, some, for some folks, unfortunately, that means no carbs at all, uh, which isn't a particularly pleasant way to go through life. Uh, but uh, certainly cutting back can improve that. We find that some people that a particular time of day is more difficult than others. Uh, that uh, breakfast. You have a slice of toast, your sugar's going to be 300, you just do the scrambled eggs uh, and cottage cheese and everything works out fine. Uh, dinner time you can handle some rice or potatoes or bread and, and it doesn't cause any as much stress. And that ties back to that, that dawn phenomenon that your body's more resistant to insulin early in the morning and that uh, you might not tolerate carbohydrates as well, the pancreas just can't quite keep up. So there's a variety of ways to try and get the pancreas to respond better, to get the liver to respond better. Uh, but that, uh, that after meal sugar climb can have a big effect on the A1C. Uh, is that the closer the A1C gets to where you want it, the more likely it is that it's the after meal sugars that are keeping it higher than where you want it to be. Um, I think the best example I have is this lady. We tried every pill, every insulin combination to try and keep her lunchtime sugars down, and none of it worked without causing problems other times of the day. And finally, it was a matter of cutting the carbohydrates down. And we went over to breakfast, she had very little. It was a package of the instant oatmeal, mm -hmm. a little splash of milk to, to wet it, and half a cup of orange juice to wa wash down her pills. And I said, cut the orange juice in half. She says, it's only half a cup. I said, dilute it with water, make it a quarter cup. Her blood sugars dropped by 150 points wow. by getting rid of what she thought was two ounces of orange juice. I don't know if it was really just half a cup. Uh, it might have been half a cup this big. <laughs> I don't know. She, she insisted that it wasn't that much, but when we cut it in half, it fixed her problem. Uh, so sometimes little changes can have a big impact, and that's where the testing comes in handy. You can experiment. You can, you can be your own uh, research lab and find out what foods are doing what to you, 
how long does it take? Uh, if you mix different things in with the meal, will that have a, an effect? Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Yes, I was just wondering if the bedtime snack had any effect on the dawn effect. They either, uh, you know, would a protein snack in the evening, you know, ameliorate that dawn effect or? It does for some people. Uh, a bedtime snack sometimes will provide enough fuel to the liver that it recognizes that everything's okay and doesn't have to produce as much sugar the next morning. And particularly protein can be helpful. Uh, the protein over time, about half of it gets converted into sugar, not at a fast enough rate that it typically raises the blood sugar though. And there are a few exceptions. And for example, uh, you, you do the 32-ounce uh, T-bone, you might find your morning sugar a bit higher the next day because uh, you just overwhelmed yourself with protein that got converted to sugar. But within a reasonable range, uh, meat's not going to raise your blood sugar. Uh, but it does provide a fuel source that the liver, if it has fuel coming in, it's less likely to be putting something back out. Uh, the protein snack is particularly helpful for people who take long-acting insulin bedtime, uh, Lantus or Levomir. Uh, people can drop low in the middle of the night and not know it, but they actually did a study with kids, and they found that by giving uh, children a bedtime snack of protein, they got nice even blood sugars through the night. If they took no snack, they dropped somewhere between 1 and 3 o'clock in the morning and then bounced back up. And if they took a carbohydrate snack, they'd spike up about 150 points, and then eventually they'd come back down, but the protein made things nice and even through the night. Another thing that works well is uncooked cornstarch. But that doesn't taste very good. Uh, I've seen recipes, I've tasted recipes. Uh, there's a company that actually made snack bars based on uncooked cornstarch. They, they tasted kind of like Tootsie Rolls and were halfway tolerable, but they had limited distribution. You, you order mail order and they might show up a month later. Uh, and, and so it wasn't a very successful business venture. Uh, other companies have other types of snack bars. I, I think Lucerna is a popular one. They don't use the cornstarch, they've used some other stuff that basically delays the carbohydrate absorption so your blood sugars will uh, be sustained over two to four hours instead of just 30 to 60 minutes. Wow. What about fruit like apples and before you go to bed? Well, that, that'll give you a, a short release of blood sugar. Uh, it, uh, it's probably <coughs> better than pudding or bread or something like that, but still the, that effect is probably going to wear off in a couple of hours. Uh, still, sometimes putting that just that little bit of extra sugar into your liver at bedtime can be enough to keep it from running so wild at four o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I was wondering. I have five grandchildren. I have three boys and two girls. Can they inherit this from me? You have type two diabetes. Well, about seventy percent of type two diabetes runs in families, and so there is certainly an increased risk of that happening. Now they're 13, 2 is 10, 1 is 8, and 1 is 4. Not, not likely to show up at this age uh, unless they are carrying an awful lot of weight. There has been an increased incidence of type 2 diabetes in children and teenagers, and they're almost universally overweight. Uh, there's a whole controversy about what we can do to deal with this childhood uh, adult type diabetes, type 2 diabetes in children in childhood obesity, and it seems to be just as complex for kids as it is for adults. They say, oh, it's the soda pop they serve in the machine. They take the soda pop out of the machines, the kids don't lose any weight, their sugars don't run any better. Oh, it's because they're not having PE classes. So they'll have one school with PE, another school without PE, no change in the weight or wow. instance of diabetes. So when they take an isolated item and change it, it doesn't make any difference. It's the whole picture all together. Now, with diabetes, you might say, well, it's that orange juice is spiking my blood sugar, but in reality, there's a lot of things going on besides that orange juice. Your medications are doing things, your stress level is having an effect on your blood sugars, what you ate the meal before is having an effect on your blood sugars, how much activity you've been getting has had an effect, and all that is adding up together to provide a number that we're trying to figure out what it means and what we need to do about it. But yeah, there, there is an increased risk, and that's also the challenge because someone will get it and they say, but no one else in the family has it. Well, no one else in the family retired at age 45, weighs 300 pounds, has high blood pressure and bad cholesterol either. Uh, and that's been a pattern I've seen, is that you know, grand, you know, great granddad lived to 85 and was skinny as a rail and never developed diabetes because after he retired he started a second industry on his own, a, a wood shop or something. And then his son uh, retired at age 65 and uh, was rather sedentary, so by 68 he got diabetes. 
then the next generation uh, gets promoted from a physical labor position to management, and now they're sitting at a desk eight hours a day, and all of a sudden the blood sugars are becoming evident at age 45. Uh, so certainly our lifestyle has an impact on this overall process. Uh, the genetics does play a part. Uh, kids are learning now to eat healthy and stay active. That's the best thing that can reduce the risk of anything happening. Yes. Okay. What time should you have your evening meal? Is there a certain time or just making the difference? Uh, the, the best time for an evening meal, uh, there probably isn't a lot of difference. And a lot of it might tie in with when you go to bed and when you're getting up the next morning. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that probably has more to do with anything. It seems that people who eat uh, a late dinner and then go to bed an hour or two later seem to struggle the most with their metabolism and their blood sugars. Uh, it seems that just being awake a, a little bit longer and allowing the body to metabolize those things while you're awake and active uh, can improve your overall metabolism. Uh, but there, there's no exact time that seems to work out best. Uh, and it's, it's a matter of experimenting and finding out what, what works best for you. Yes, doctor, is there, you see any value in using inulin, sprinkling it on your food? Uh, sprinkling what on the food? Inulin. Inulin. Yeah, they're putting it in ice cream and they're putting it in the pasta. They're making that's a lot of these oh. things that's kicking it down. They're using inulin, and I got some of this from Trader Joe's, uh -huh. and it's sprinkling on the food. Well, I sent them an email. And says, how much do you sprinkle on the food? Yeah. They said about a teaspoon, but oh. they didn't say how much food you sprinkle about. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sprinkle yeah. is not implied. Before it gets That's right. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure uh, just how beneficial that is. It's supposed to have an effect on the metabolism. And, and I think it's a lot of, like a lot of different things that, that we've come across. It works for a few folks and, and maybe not for many others. And it may depend on how far along you are in your diabetes history. Uh, I know, for example, uh, chromium was real popular in the 1980s. It's still popular. Uh, but back then it was popular enough and few enough people were providing it that you were paying $40 a month for it instead of $4 a month. Uh, and chromium seems to have a subtle effect on the liver that it may respond better to insulin. And in, in some folks it's the, the key ingredient in getting their blood sugars back on track. Uh, and so when we only had one, one category of pills, this was the other hope that it might work before we started someone on insulin. Uh, and like I said, there's some people who are very sensitive and some folks that it doesn't seem to make a difference. The same thing's true of cinnamon. A little sprinkle doesn't do any good. You need two to six grams a day. That'd be about three cans. Oh! Oh! So, so don't try putting that on your toast. Oh, that'd be awful. Yes, they have capsules and they have liquid extract so that you can get a therapeutic dose of cinnamon. And the cinnamon seems to directly help the pancreas react better to food. And for some, pardon me? Three cans you need? Yeah, I think there's only, there's only about a gram of cinnamon. It's uh, you know, that fine powder. Uh, you know, the amount you put on your toast, you, you can taste it, you can't measure it. It's so light. Oh. Oh, yes? I've heard turmeric is supposed to be good, too. Turmeric. Turmeric. Yeah, chili seasoning. Uh, well, that's yeah, that's what gives the chili spices that yeah. chili flavor so it doesn't taste like spaghetti sauce. Uh, yeah, there may be a subtle effect with that as well. I don't know if they're going to end up encapsulating that to give a, a therapeutic benefit. Uh, there's all kinds of, of different uh, agents out there that seem to have a metabolic effect. And like I said, it, it may work for it may work for you. Uh, don't stop anything until you know it's working. Uh, yes. And, um, what are the chances? Um, that if you're, you're not genetically inclined towards the diabetes, why do people develop it later in life? It just, their pancreas just stops working at 45? Uh, the, the question is uh, developing diabetes later in life when you don't have a family history. Yes. Uh, and what part does, how many parts your diet, exercise, and family history, type 2 diabetes plays on each other? In, in the development of type 2 diabetes, uh, as I said, the family history uh, predicts about 70% of our cases. Seven. In the other 30% where there isn't a family history, there's often a history of other conditions that are associated with diabetes. Early heart disease, uh, high triglycerides, low HDL cholesterol, carrying weight around the middle. Uh, those are all, are all markers that are associated with type 2 diabetes. They don't necessarily cause it, but they tend to run in a pack. And if those other features are present, then it's more likely that a, a given individual is going to develop overt type 2 diabetes. Now, in terms of type 1 diabetes, it can happen at any age. And I've seen folks age 20, 40, 60 who come in with <coughs> ketoacidosis and they have true type 1 diabetes. 
the immune system has damaged their pancreas, they can't make it anymore. Uh, it has nothing to do with what they ate. Uh, chances are there's no family history. Only 10% of people have a family history of type 1 diabetes. Uh, but, but it can strike at any age. And um, it can be a challenge for the doctor to recognize that because if you're 50 years old, you're not expected to have type 1, yeah. uh, even if you're not particularly overweight and have good looking lipids. And so uh, some folks get stuck on pills and struggle for a while until eventually they recognize that what's really necessary is insulin. Mm -hmm. I have none of those my, none of those problems you referred to. Yes. But my doctor came that was from the stress. I was having severe back problems. I ended up got surgery for about a year and a half or two years where I couldn't I mean, lay in the bed. And, is that a possibility too? Of, it, of it, the stress? It's, uh, certainly it's a possibility. It's long term stress. Uh, uh, the, you know, the body's finding this fine balance, and stress uh, increases hormones that cause sugars to run higher. Uh, plus the inactivity, uh, the, the relative bed rest uh, mm -hmm. is going to increase the likelihood that the sugar is going to get activated. Uh, so that there's a, a variety of factors influencing the ultimate development. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, if you have an impending surgery, is there something that needs to be considered or done? Now, the question is about impending surgery. Should anything be done special or different? It's real valuable to have the blood sugars consistently under 200 and preferably under 150 because that allows the immune system to work at its best and for healing after surgery to work at its best. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're on metformin, you're not going to be able to take it for a couple days after the surgery mm -hmm. because it can build up to toxic levels while your body gets rid of the anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And if your blood sugars are heavily dependent on metformin, then you need to talk to your doctor about some alternatives. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're type 2 and you're on insulin, you probably you will be given instructions to cut your insulin in half, and that generally works out well. If you're on basal insulin at night only, I wouldn't cut it in half because you need that insulin carrying you through uh, your surgery time. And uh, the other aspect is that you, you need to find that balance. If you have occasional lows at night from your nighttime insulin, then you need to back off. Uh, because if you eat, then you're, they told you not to eat anything for 12 hours, and now you've got a the problem, they're going to postpone your surgery. On the other hand, you show up uh, to pre-op with a finger stick of 280, the anesthesiologist says, I'm not going to do it. And so you go home and schedule it for another day. Uh, so um, I've, I've had some patients you know, get up every three hours through the night and do finger sticks and give themselves small doses of insulin if they've tended towards higher morning blood sugars. Uh, I can also admit them to the hospital and have the nurse do it for them if necessary. Uh, but it's, it's just almost as easy to do at home. Uh, I give the patient the same instructions that I give the nurse as long as either they get up or someone gets them up to do it to make sure that, that morning sugar is in a safe range, then the, then the surgery is a go. Yes? Is there any way, you know, as everybody's got diabetes, it's for the miracle cure. Is there any way by losing weight, keeping the A1Cs under control, and just and getting maybe off the meds that you can reverse it? It, it is reversible to a certain degree. Uh, there's there's two components. One is the insulin resistance, where the body ignores the insulin, and that can be substantially weight dependent and, and food dependent. Uh, the other aspect is the pancreas losing its ability over time to make insulin. This happens in type two diabetes. It's not the immune system. There's something other else going on, either intrinsic in the beta cells or some toxins from the diabetes that's causing the cells to fail. And the cells are going to fail over time. Pills will buy you time. It can set the clock back two to five years. Uh, they did an experiment once thinking, well, if the pancreas didn't have to work, it'll last forever. And so they put these people on insulin first as soon as they were diagnosed with diabetes. Mm -hmm. And those cells kept going right downhill just as fast as if they didn't take mm -hmm. anything. So, so there's a certain programmed rate of failure. Uh, that will slow down significantly with uh, proper eating and with uh, weight reduction. And probably the best example is the patients who undergo bariatric surgery. They're 200 pounds overweight, and they're taking 200 units of insulin a day and three different pills. And they go through the surgery. They lose the 180 of the 200 pounds they need to. They're off all their medications. Their A1C is 6%. And the, the surgical data indicates that 80% uh, of those folks will remain off medications for three years. And we don't know about five or 10 year data yet. But, uh, it certainly makes a difference. And I've had patients equally successful without surgery. Uh, that they've really cleaned up their eating habits, they've got a vigorous exercise program, and they've been able to slow that decline enough that they're not needing more and more medication and needing more and so on. I've had some folks who've been successful for 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good sign. Yeah, sure is. Would that also help your cholesterol? 
It probably will. Uh, certainly the triglycerides are going to get better. Uh, generally with weight loss, the HDL cholesterol will come up. Uh, with exercise, the HDL cholesterol will come up even more. And there's a generally a benefit on the, uh, on the lipids. It's harder to get the lipids back into the target range without medications compared to the blood sugars. And even the, pa the patients with bariatric surgery, uh, the, the lipids are probably the most likely going to need to be treated again later. Uh, they, they often normalize for a, a brief amount of time, but there's a real strong genetic component to the, to the cholesterol, uh, the, the HDL cholesterol in particular, uh, that can be hard to take care of. And exercise is beneficial to the HDL cholesterol, but it's not going to take you from a 35 to a 75. Uh, it's, it's not that powerful of an influence. Uh, there's a recent study, and they looked at runners and figured out how much they were running and how much their HDL went up. And basically, the folks who are running more than 13 miles a week were going to increase their HDL by more than 10%. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it's it's helpful, but it's not going to be the cure-all. Right. Yes. Well, can you discuss the use of benzothiamine for uh, neuropathy? Sure. The question is about benzothiamine and neuropathy. Neuropathy is damage to the nerves uh, from chemicals that are derived from sugar. Uh, the nerves need very little sugar to actually function, and the channels are very small to allow sugar to normally enter the nerves. And when your blood sugars are running high, the rest of the sugar basically just soaks right into the nerve, and so not going through that channel doesn't get processed properly. And so it gets attached to different <laughs> proteins, kind of gets stuffed inside the cell, uh, and is eventually disposed of, but as it, it's accumulating, it causes the nerves to not work right, and there can be pain, tingling, uh, stabbing sensations, burning, uh, novocaine wearing off sensation. Uh, if it goes on long enough, the, the nerves can be irreversibly damaged with numbness. Uh, sometimes simply getting the blood sugars under better control can help this. So the, the enzyme that gets rid of those toxins can finally catch up from the burden. Uh, the, the pain might actually worsen briefly before it gets better, but it, it will get better. Other times, people need chemical help to, to get the nerves to heal. Uh, the current drugs that we use, uh, prescription drugs, are all there to cover up <coughs> the symptoms. Either they work in the brain or they work in the nerves, and they tell the body, oh, you're, you're just imagining it doesn't really hurt. Uh, it's like taking a pain pill for anything else, a headache or a, or a strained knee or something. You're taking basically a pain pill uh, so that you don't know that the, there's something wrong with the feet. The benfotiamine actually speeds up the, the cleaning mechanism inside the nerves. And so it's reducing the amount of those toxins in the nerves. They haven't measured levels in the nerves. What they've done is measured the blood levels of these toxins in people. And they find that the blood levels will drop with this vitamin. And it drops quickly. If you take, uh, I think it was seven capsules a day, uh, blood levels drop by 40% in three days. Uh, to get the nerves to heal, you take two capsules twice a day, and it takes three to six weeks for the nerves to start healing up. Now, sometimes the damage is so bad that this isn't going to help. Or sometimes there might be something in addition to or other than diabetes causing the nerve damage, and this isn't going to help. Uh, but this is cheap, it is perfectly safe, the side effect profile is virtually nil. I think I've had three people quit it because they didn't feel good on it or itched a little bit. Uh, you compare this to, this costs about $20 a month. And you compare this to a prescription drug uh, like Cymbalta, which has recently been FDA approved for neuropathy, it costs hundred dollars a month, and there's about a thirty percent side effect profile: uh, nausea, uh, restlessness, fatigue. You name it, and it's it's a very high incidence of side effects. Uh, and the benfotiamine is uh, endlessly tolerable. They couldn't kill mice with it. Uh, there was no lethal dose in, in critters when they were doing FDA studies. Uh, but because it never really gained any market share, and the patent expired, no one cared about it. The FDA finally said. We don't want to worry about it. We'll, we'll label it as a vitamin. And just make sure that it, that's all you're putting in your capsule in the cell. That's, that's all it takes now. Yeah, it's spelled B-E-N-F-O-T-I-A-M-I-N-E. -E. And there's a website, benfotiming.net. And uh, they'll, they'll ship it to you. Call them with the credit card. Uh, I don't know if they take PayPal. But um, it's very easy. And because it's not a prescription, you don't have to ask your doctor to do it. It's perfectly compatible with anything else you're taking. Oh. So if it won't interact with your other medications, if you're already on something for neuropathy, you can add this. And then if it seems to be working, you can talk to your doctor about getting rid of some of the prescription medications you're taking uh, for your neuropathy. Okay. So it's, um, uh, yes? Why this form of B1? 
Uh, this form uh, of B1 has been made fat soluble. And the reason is that normal thiamine has to go through a special mechanism in your intestines to get into your bloodstream. And you can only absorb about 12 milligrams a day of thiamine. The benfotiamine has been chemically modified so that you absorb 100% of what you take. It's not stored in the fat cells, so there, there's no risk of toxicity to that degree. But by being fat soluble, that means that it passes through the, the fat layer of the, the, the lining of the gut and bypasses that mechanism. And so that, that's why that seems to work as well as it does. But because it's chemically modified, you're not going to find it in your health food stores because it's not natural. Uh, but it's working through the natural mechanism to, to get rid of the glucose toxin. I've, I've been recommending this just as a as general health con for diabetes. They're currently doing studies to see if it can slow down eye disease and kidney disease. That takes a lot longer to see than to find out if people's feet are feeling better. It takes two to four years to see if eyes and kidneys stabilize. It takes two to four weeks to find out if nerves stabilize. Because the nerve stabilization is simply a question, are your feet better? They make it more complicated, but that's the essential question. Whereas with the eyes and kidneys, it takes uh, precise measurements over time to demonstrate a benefit. And because no one owns the patent, because there's no huge profit margins, there's no big company spending millions of dollars to research it and, and find out if it really does any good. Would you spell it again? Sure. It's B E N F O T I A M I N E. Thank you. M I M I N E. M I N E. Right. Do you want the number? Well, if it was not. Uh, 1 800. <laughs> well, I, was, I gotta look it up here. I, okay. I used to have it memorized. Let's see here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. It's 1 888. Close enough. Close enough. 493 8014. Uh, I, I've been recommending this gentleman. I have no investment in this company or getting any kickbacks or anything. Uh, he's been a, a very. Uh, honest and forthright businessman. He has his uh, FDA inspection of this plant and uh, capsule uh, certification all posted on his website. Uh, he's actually lowered his prices three times before he finally bumped them back up again. Uh, and so you might find it a dollar or two cheaper here. I, I've been recommending him because he's, he's, uh, he's been so good to all my patients. Yes? With neuropathy, do you need to see a neurologist? Or is your primary care physician able to help with that? Your primary care physician should be able to help with that. There's a couple of things that should be checked before assuming that it's diabetes. Uh, you should have a thyroid panel checked uh, because low thyroid can cause nerve damage and that's reversible by treating the thyroid condition. If you have a B12 deficiency or a folate deficiency, it can cause nerve damage that's reversible. And I don't know about the water quality on the private wells out here, but there are certain heavy metal toxicities uh, that need to be considered. Uh, lead, cadmium, I remember the others. Antimony? Uh, no. Pardon me? Maybe antimony? Antimony? Yeah. Yeah. Copper? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how prevalent copper is in terms of neuropathy. But, uh, you know, if, if you're developing neuropathy and you're on well water, get it checked. And if it's clean, don't worry about it. Either that or drink bottled water. Or, uh, and you're not, you're not going to get enough residue on your dishes to worry about it. Uh, but it's, it's pretty rare to find a, a chronic heavy metal exposure causing this. Uh, I think I found about two in the last 14 years. Uh, I'm, I'm in Reno, so I ask them, are they on city water? If the answer is yes, I don't worry about it any further. Yes? I'm going to stay on neuropathy. Okay. Since I'm supporting my wife. All right. 12 years ago, diagnosed neuropathy not diagnosed diabetic. Mm -hmm. But I think I heard you say, Dr. Dan, was some can be reversed, some might not be able to be reversed. And that she's going through some pills and stuff, but it's not getting better. Uh, this vitamin or whatever you just recommended <laughs> can only help. But you said that some things cannot be reversed. If it was 12 years ago, not diagnosed or treated for diabetic, does that put us more in harm's way long term than short term? If we try this, because we're gonna, we got to try it. Right. Yeah. To tell you the truth, I really can't 
give you a good answer for that. I've seen people who've had neuropathy for years and they get better. I've seen folks who've had neuropathy for only a few weeks and they don't get better. There, there's a lot about that that we don't understand. Yeah. The, the three main organ systems that are affected directly by high blood sugar are the nerves, the eyes, and the kidneys. In type 2 diabetes, we worry a lot about heart attacks because that's what's going to shorten your life far more than the diabetes will. But these other things can cause a lot of trouble along that way. We treat the blood pressure aggressively because it'll help the eyes, kidneys, as well as the heart. We treat the cholesterol aggressively, specifically protect the heart, uh, and, and also for strokes. Uh, but the blood sugar control affects the kidneys, the eyes, and the nerves. And people can have different susceptibilities to different systems. Uh, generally, we expect whatever is happening to the eyes is happening to the kidneys and vice versa. Oh, really? Uh, but in reality, that is often, that there's uh, disparate uh, pro processes. I'll get a call from an eye doctor, this patient's having horrible hemorrhages, and I look at the chart, and just a month ago, the protein in the urine was perfectly normal. Yeah. So there's something that is making the eyes more vulnerable than the kidneys. And in type 2 diabetes, I see neuropathy very frequently in comparison to kidneys, and the kidneys are much more likely to be showing the process compared to the eyes. So uh, they, they, they don't all run together. And I've seen a number of folks, and their blood sugars are practically normal. They go to the neurologist because of these symptoms. Their doctor checked the blood sugar, and it was fine. The neurologist finds a fasting blood sugar of 102 and says, oh, it's your diabetes. And the patient's A1C is 5.8%. All the blood sugars are looking fine. I don't think it's the diabetes causing the neuropathy. Uh, there may be some other chemical process that we can't identify. But interestingly, I have a few folks that have neuropathy that got sent to me because of marginal blood sugars or marginal thyroid levels. And normalizing all that didn't make the neuropathy the least bit better, and the benefit timing still seemed to help. So it's worth a try. Uh, and again, the, the duration uh, doesn't seem to make much of a difference. Uh, the, the severity of the numbness might be a better predictor, and when someone can't feel anything from the knees down, uh, then chances are this isn't going to have much of an impact. Uh, for folks who have primarily a pain component, uh, then it's much more likely to be helpful. Yes? I have an essential tremor of the right left hand. Would diabetes in any way be affecting that? It just started this year. I haven't seen any. It's driving me up the wall <coughs> because I can't write, etc. And I was just wondering if the vitamin you had just talked about. <laughs> Sorry about that. If the vitamin you had just talked about, mm -hmm. would that help? I mean, I know it's the thymus, thalamus gland, I guess you pronounce it. Oh, yeah. I know that's what causes it. Mm -hmm. But is there any way that the diabetes has affected that? to create this situation? I, I don't know of, of any information that diabetes will cause a, an essential tremor. It may, the sugars going up and down may, could affect the severity, you know, particularly if your sugar is dropping, uh, the nervous system gets a little bit more twitchy anyway, and it's quite possible that an essential tremor would worsen under those circumstances. Uh, I, I have no information at all whether the bento timing would be of any help under that particular circumstance, because other than knowing that the thalamus is sending out signals that it shouldn't, we don't know why uh, or, or the best way to stabilize it. Uh, but again, this is a, a non-toxic uh, vitamin, and other than wasting 20 bucks, you won't uh, won't be running into any harm in trying that. Try that. Okay. Yes. Um, getting back to HDL. Um, if you had continuously high readings on the HDL, what problems can you have with that? Is that like having the same problems with LDL? Uh, high, the only problem with the high HDL is you're going to be around for a long time to put up with your diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> but why does the chart say high if that's not a problem? Well, they, it, it says high because they are required by law to state a normal range. And the normal range, in reality, normal range for a woman should be about 50 to 65. And so if it's above 65, they call that abnormally high, which is a good thing. 
so it's, it's it's just one of those lab things that gets real annoying. Uh, the, the HDL, as I mentioned before, is a critical component, and I, I see people with great HDLs, but their cholesterol is a little bit on the high side. The triglycerides actually look good, and the LDL, the bad cholesterol, comes back at 113. And the cardiologist or the primary care doctor is saying that should be under 100, that should be under 70 because you have diabetes. Well, the people with diabetes who have the high risk are, are so because of the low HDL. And if you look at someone with diabetes and someone without diabetes, why is a person with diabetes three times as likely to have a heart attack in the next five years given the same age? The LDL cholesterol is identical. Both of them have an LDL of 112. The person without diabetes is going to have an HDL of 60 and a, a balance between their total cholesterol and HDL of three and a half. And the person with diabetes is going to have an HDL of 35 and a balance between their total cholesterol and HDL of six. LDL is exactly the same. And so when I see someone with type 2 diabetes or presumed type 2 diabetes and their triglycerides are nice and low and their HDL is 60 or 70, or as, high, as high as they can measure it, and the cholesterol might be just a little bit on the, on the high side, <coughs> the risk of heart disease is about the same as someone without diabetes. And you can play with these numbers on what's called the risk calculator. Uh, I know the National Institutes of Health has one. Uh, and basically you punch in your age and your fasting blood sugar and your blood pressure and your cholesterol parameters and it will give you the likelihood in the next five or ten years of having a heart attack or stroke or dying, depending on which model you use. And then you can play with the cholesterol number. Okay, so doc wants that LDL under 70, it's 110, knock 40, 40 points off your cholesterol. Don't change any of the other measurements in there. And find out what happens to your risk. And in some folks, that benefit is huge because they have low HDL. And in some folks, it changes a trivial percent. It goes from four and a half percent to four percent. And my doctor is trying to convince me to go on a stat uh, because my LDL was 102, and I had an HDL of 75 that year. Uh, and so I showed him the engine. I said, "Here's my risk with with, the, with, the, with those numbers. It's the four and a half percent. And with your treatment, it'll drop to three and a half percent. That's that's a 25 percent improvement, isn't it? Uh, it is, but in reality, it's uh, you know, I'm improving my chances of not having a heart attack by one in a hundred in the next ten years. I don't think I want to take a pill that long to uh, for that kind of prevention. My numbers change. I'll think about it. But, uh, yeah. it, it can be very helpful. And we get misled with some of the advertising. Reduce your risk by such and such a percent. Well, you need to consider what your baseline risk is to begin with. Uh, some doctors insist that the A1C should be 6.5%, not 7%, because a different organization came out with that, with that tighter recommendation. And that recommendation was based entirely on one person in 100 having, uh, not developing eye disease. Mm. Now, considering how many low blood sugars are going to happen to the other 99 who didn't benefit from that treatment, uh, it's, it's hard to argue that I should try and squeeze it that time. Yeah. Yes. Are studies showing that um, any aspect of these two types of diabetes are age related? Uh, age relation. Uh, certainly with type 1, it is much more common under the age of 21. Mm -hmm. And in type 2, the, the average age is going down. It used to be 60, then 50. Uh, I think the average age presently is in the high 40s or low 50s. Mm -hmm. um, and there's two aspects to that. On the one hand, folks are living longer in general. And we have some type 2s diagnosed in their 80s. Uh, and on the other hand, we have uh, people in their 20s and 30s being diagnosed. So the, the average age for type 2 is, uh, is, is kind of hovering in that range. But there's, there's no absolute cutoff or, uh, or criteria based on age for either one. Thank you. Quiet. Could you explain more about the postprandial tests? The blood sugars? The postprandial test. Uh, that basically means looking at the blood sugar before and after a meal to find out how well your body reacted. And, and ideally, there shouldn't be more than a 40 to 60 point change. Uh, the absolute numbers, uh, the American Diabetes Association recommends under 180. Uh, other organizations recommend under 140, which is essentially normal. Um, but if it would get to, uh, somewhere between 140 and 180, is probably a reasonable degree of climb. They have a fancy test called the glycomark that takes into average most of your blood sugars after meals. Now the problem is when I send that order to the lab, some of them don't recognize it, some of them send out the wrong test, uh, and it, it, has, it doesn't have the same degree of establishment as the hemoglobin A1C. Uh, 
Uh, but I, I think that simply doing an after meal finger stick every once in a while is a good way to find out if your body's still responding. If I see someone whose morning sugars are looking great, but their A1C has gone from a six and a half to a seven and a half, it's pretty reasonable that the result of that is due to uh, their blood sugar climbing more after meals. And so I pretty much routinely test people uh, with finger stick when they come into my office because just about everyone comes in after having eaten something in the last three to four hours. It'll give me some idea of how well they're metabolizing things. Uh, a gentleman yesterday, his A1C is still 9%, and his fasting sugars are 100, and we got an uh, after meal test of 140. And I'm thinking, well, maybe he has a blood condition that makes his A1C read higher than it really is, so we're running some additional tests to wow. figure that out. Uh, but more commonly, what I see is someone who shows me their morning sugars that are fine. We got an A1C of 9%. And when I do the, the after lunch finger stick, it's 3.30. <laughs> and they absolutely swear that the only time they go to the drive-in and get the Big Mac fries <laughs> <laughs> and shake is on the way to my office. Oh, uh, wow. they, they only do that once every three months. Well, if the A1C is 9%, they're probably eating other things as well that aren't the healthiest choice. Uh, I say, well, okay, well, we'll cut the office visits down, but more importantly, you need to, you need to get a handle on, on the other uh, 363 days in the year. How long after you eat should you take that? Uh, one to two hours is going to be re reaching its peak. And the reason of one versus two is depending on how much protein and fat. And if you're digesting a little bit more slowly, it'll, it'll peak at two hours. If it's a straight carbohydrate meal, meal and toast for breakfast with a little bit of fruit juice, it's going to be spiking up and reaching its peak in 60 minutes. How about at three or four hours? Uh, three or four hours, if it's still eight at that time, that means the body's definitely slow to bring things down. Uh, there's, there's two phases to insulin release, and it's very common for the first phase to be gone, and that's why you get that quick spike in an hour. And then the second phase has to kind of chase after missing the first phase, and it can take three to five hours for it to get pulled back down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, four hour looking pretty reasonable isn't telling you all that much. If it's unreasonable, then we know we've got a more serious problem. It's probably even more toxic than one or two. Uh, and that's where some of the bedtime numbers get interesting. And when I see high bedtime sugars, one, did you test after you had your bedtime snack of ice cream and oatmeal cookies? <laughs> or two, that some people, you know, they eat and they're ready for bed two hours later. And so it's per, what I'm seeing is not a bedtime sugar, it's a two hour after dinner sugar. <laughs> yes? I take my blood sugars after fasting from dinner mm -hmm. to before breakfast in the morning and I've been doing this for several years every other day and I can tell when my blood sugars are high in the morning it must be something I ate that night maybe like spaghetti or meat, a pasta of some sort white rice whatever mm -hmm. and is there anything wrong with that normally I'm good and my AC1 is good, uh -huh. and so I've just continued with that, thinking I know what I do the day before, or that night. Like if I eat late, my blood sugars will rise the right. next morning. So should I still be testing that evening? Well, it's certainly helping you understand what your body's going through. And, and the other advantage is that if something should change in your metabolism, you'll be able to catch it a little bit quicker. Uh, it's perfectly reasonable that you know, when somebody's going to eat something, you know it's going to raise your blood sugar, but it's something special to you, and otherwise you've been real good and taking good care of yourself, and it's acceptable to let that number go out of range once in a while. Uh, the challenge is people grow complacent about their blood sugars, and they're testing twice a day and the numbers are all under 120. So they go to twice a week and then they go to twice a month. And they go to twice a year and somewhere between their January test and their July test, they're back in the emergency room with a blood sugar of 400. Oh. Because they took it for granted that all their blood sugars were normal. And because they weren't testing, they didn't realize that they were slipping into eating habits that weren't healthy for them uh, until all of a sudden their vision's blurry, they're up four times a night to urinate, uh, and their mouth is, is glued shut because they're so dry. Yes? I know that water is good for you, basically, but does it contribute to healthy diabetes at all? My uncle recently was diagnosed with diabetes at the age of 87, 
and, and the doctor says, well, drink a glass of water and keep water for them. Come on, do one. Okay. Okay. The, the question is, does, does water help diabetes or, or blood sugar control? Does it <coughs> throughout the day if you drink it? it? Well, if the sugars are running real high, it helps to wash the sugar out through the kidneys. Oh, okay. But that's usually with numbers around 300, so <laughs> we don't want to wait that long. Uh, and it's usually the acute circumstances like that. You know, someone gets dehydrated, uh, the adrenaline gets going because they've been out in the yard, kids playing football, uh, you know, getting, getting a little bit too carried away out in the garage, and even though you're working real hard to you find your blood sugar is you know, 250 or so, well, some water getting rehydrated is probably the best thing to do under those particular circumstances. Uh, but otherwise, you know, if, you know, if the fasting sugars are 160, drinking water isn't going to make any difference. Uh, certainly being dehydrated in general isn't good for you. You get tired, you get headaches. You know, a whole variety of symptoms just because you should have had a couple of glasses of water and instead you're living on coffee all day. It took me a long time to figure out that was my problem. <laughs> so I alternate coffee, water, coffee. Water. <laughs> yes? Two-part question. Are there any physiological things that you will notice if your blood sugar is low or high. I know Betty, when she takes it, she goes in the morning, oh my. But she didn't feel anything different. Okay. Uh, the question is, what, what high and low blood sugars might feel like? Uh, part of it's going to depend on where you're running to begin with. And if your sugars are mostly running 120 to 200, uh, then if you have a so-called normal sugar of 75 or 80, you might feel funny. If on What's the funny? Hand, uh, usually it's adrenaline, a kind of shaky, a little bit sway, a little bit nervous. Uh, if it gets a bit lower, maybe a little bit of difficulties concentrating, spots in front of your eyes. Right. You had a low in the middle of the night and your body fixed it. Uh, you might recall having some bad dreams uh, or wake up in the morning with a headache. Uh, uh, the, 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 the slow thinking, can't remember your spouse's name, uh, driving on the wrong way wrong side of the highway. Oh, uh, that, so that, far, that, so good. <laughs> that, that indicates severe glucose deficiency in the brain. It would be very scary. Uh, not only because you don't remember what happened and people are telling you about it, but because you might get hurt. And I've had people actually physically injured from automobile accidents. Mm -hmm. uh, one guy uh, got cuffed by the cops when he popped out from his motor vehicle accident and took a swing at the guy. Um, he, was in serious trouble. He later did suffer a brain injury from another car accident. And that's low. And that's very low. Uh, usually most folks are going to feel it. They're going to be a little bit shaky, a little bit sweaty, a little bit hungry, uh, kind of a restless and say just a little bit too much adrenaline on board. Uh, and, and where that's going to be depends on what your overall average sugars are and how often you go low. Uh, the more often you hammer it into the 50s, the less likely you're going to react to it with adrenaline. And you'll still end up goofy. Uh, at some point, and someone's going to have to put a glass of orange juice in your hands, but you won't get the adrenaline rush prior to reaching that point. Uh, with high sugars, there's a variety of tolerances. So some folks can feel perfectly fine until they hit 180. Some folks are perfectly fine until they hit 380. Sometimes it's sleepiness uh, or drowsiness. Uh, sometimes they recognize that tasty feeling in their mouth that they might be thirsty. You notice that their urine's running a little bit clearer and more frequent than usual. Uh, that, that usually doesn't happen, the, the urine and thirst doesn't usually happen if you just ate three Twinkies and spiked yourself up in an hour or two. That's more likely a little bit of fuzzy thinking or, or sleepiness. As, as it's sustained, then it's more likely to, to, to cause the, the thirst and urination symptoms. Incoherent, low, lethargic, high. Yeah. yeah. Great. And then if the liver, I, I've heard you say liver mm -hmm. quite a bit, so this must be centralized to the liver and it rejuvenates itself. Is it saying that there's something wrong with the liver, or is it just the way it's processing the sugar? It has to do with the way the liver is processing the sugar. Uh, if you have a medication that is forcing insulin into your system, say you're, you're on glycerin, you're on too high of a dose, and it will force insulin into your system even when you're not eating. Now the liver can't make sugar because it's getting an insulin signal. And if it sees insulin, it thinks there's food. I better start storing sugar. And so the liver, instead of releasing sugar, stores it, your blood sugar goes down, you get shaky, sweaty, hungry. Uh, if you take too much insulin in an injection, the exact same process happens. So medications that don't force the pancreas to work, that don't uh, provide insulin directly, are much less likely to cause low blood sugar. So metformin, <coughs> Actos, Avandia, uh, Bieta, Genuvia, all those are much gentler in terms of having likely low blood sugars. I have two questions. 
the first one is uh, the new inhalant uh, insulin replacing injections. Yes. Um, how beneficial is that? Uh, it works well, except that the company wasn't making enough money and they're going to stop manufacturing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is, I, I read or I saw a lot of things about islet cell transplants a couple of years ago, uh -huh. and I've seen nothing about it since then. And it had a very high success rate. How likely is that that it's, that it's still successful, and will it be widely available to type 1 diabetics uh, as almost a cure all? Or is it, the idea of buying islet cell transplants is that they extract the insulin producing part of the pancreas from a dead donor and take just those cells that make the insulin and, and put it into someone who needs it. Uh, by two years, not too many people are still insulin free. Uh, so that, that's been a, a major challenge. They, they basically can't get enough cells out of the pancreas. And so they're refining their technology to try and extract those cells. So that's, that's one factor. The other factor is to prevent the immune system from rejecting those foreign cells without otherwise making the individual susceptible to other complications from suppressing mm -hmm. the immune system. And they've worked on a variety of mixtures to try and achieve that that, that are showing varying degrees of success. Uh, and, and the biggest limiting factor now is that it takes two pancreases to cure one person with diabetes if you weigh under 170 pounds. And if you're over 170, they, they don't even admit you into the program because uh, they don't want to have to grab three organs to treat one person. Uh, right now, if you get a whole organ transplant, you only need one whole organ, but there's all kinds of complications with that as well. They're hoping to find stem cells that they can wake up in your own pancreas uh, that will produce insulin. They still have to figure out how to prevent the immune system from attacking those, uh, but they're doing some interesting research identifying stem cells in your own body that uh, would, would provide an alternative to dead donors.